Hello everyone, this is my first ever review-ish video of a Pokemon ROM hack. I decided that I wanted to dip my toes in this type of content because I want to try out something different. I came across Pokemon Amalga Magenta, a short ROM hack made by the Pokemon Alteret and Varia Blue team, perfect for a first tryout. This ROM hack takes place in a new region, it adds the cosmic type and it contains over 70 type swapped Pokemon with new designs, called Altermons. This sounds very promising, so I'm hoping for a good, new Pokemon experience. If you have played Pokemon Amalgam Magenta, tell me what you think of it. When we start up the game, we are greeted with this eerie, creepy cast form. I gotta say, it's a pretty neat title screen. Something tells me that the story is gonna revolve around this thing. Beyond the title screen, we get the usual text-based explanation that is present in every Pokemon Fire Red ROM hack. This one has unique text that explains some tidbits about the ROM hack and it closes off with a link to the Alterverse Discord and all contributors to the game. The segment where Oak introduces us to the world of Pokemon is played out in the form of a video, or at least that's what the game is trying to present to the player. Apparently we have joined an expedition group that's going to investigate this weird guest form. form. Like usual, I name my character Genosi and I immediately notice that there is no sequence that asks to name my rival, already spicing up things I see. Our character starts in what seems to be a lab. I check the PC to see if it has a potion in it and whoa, the sprite of the PC changes. I want to report this bug in the Discord server, but this other PC says that it's not good for your mental health. So I delete Discord from my computer instead. This game is full of fun little dialogue when you interact with objects and NPCs. You will see a lot of those during a playthrough. This computer here has Pokemon Alteret open on an emulator, pretty cool detail. Interacting with the NPCs and other objects outside of the building gives us the first pieces of the story. We have learned that we have started the game in Aris Outpost. To trigger the next story event, we try to get into the tall grass and get stopped by Professor Oak. Like normal, we get the usual sequence of events, but with a different dialogue that fits the game's new setting. We get to choose one of the three starters and they are all electric types, with their own strengths and weaknesses. The first one is Charging, who sports the new Cosmic type. It looks like an alter form of coughing, so I suppose it's a slow, tanky fellow. Whitening is Wingo's alter form. Apparently it's speedy, but knowing Pelipper it's probably not gonna turn out that fast. It's an electric ghost type, I might pick this one. The final choice is Boreal, an electric ice type, which is one of the best offensive type combinations possible. It looks like the alter form of Poipole. I pick Whitening and it comes equipped with a Lucky Egg. It also has Swift Swim as an ability, so I might try to look for something that has Drizzle. Like Vanilla Fire Red, we fight our first battle, but against Oaks 8 this time around. This is actually a great way to introduce the Cosmic type, because the opponent has a Chlorosis which is Grass Cosmic. Oak explains the weaknesses and resistances. He also points out that Whitening just happens to have a Dragon-type attack to hit Chlorosis super effectively, so the battle is over very quickly. After our first battle, we are off to get a package for Professor Oak. The Pokémart is in the same town instead of the next one, so it's a short trip. Oak gives us the Pokédex and explains that our Pokéballs can be used multiple times. That's something I wanna see in action. He also says that there are over 70 species to capture. I am definitely gonna complete the Pokédex in this game, since it's such a short adventure. At the end of the conversation, we get the task to head to Sticks Badlands. On my way to the next destination, I catch a Maniwag, Beacon and Vinop, my first members of the team. A little further, I encounter the first Pokemon Center. The NPCs in here give a small explanation of what is new, but I rather do it myself. <coughs> Pokemarts are now fused with Pokemon Centers. There is also a move reminder and name changer in every Pokemon Center. Next to the Pokemart NPC, there is the manager, Marty the Martman. He is a returning character in every Pokemon Center that will reward the player with a voucher that adds new items in the shop and ATM if he is beaten in battle. He always battles with at least 5 Pokemon. His encounters are pretty easy though. 
on the right side in the Pokemon Center, there is a small area where you can grind EXP on a Pokemon called Substitute. These are catchable, but the catch rate is very low. Luckily, the new mechanic of infinite catching attempts per Pokeball proves to be very useful here. A Pokeball only gets consumed once a Pokemon is caught, so you can try as many times as you want. I quickly grind my current team to level 10 and continue on to the Styx Badlands. I fight a few trainers with my very overleveled Pokemon and some notable things that I encountered during this journey. There was a Manduac giving me a thumbs up somehow, a free choice band, which is insane at this point in the game, and new encounters in Boulder P, Anki and Low Trap. I add Boulder P and Anki to the team. From the Styx Badlands, we can enter Styx Grotto, the Ruins of Ruins. Here we can encounter some new Pokemon in Ruins and Peshpoke. It's a big cave that's separated into a few smaller caves. At the end of Styx Badlands, I reach Leet Outpost, which is a town in a forest looking area. It has some grass patches where I catch two new Pokemon, Resky and Hirkata. Now it's time for a lore update. From the NPCs, I learned that Eris Outpost, the location where the game started, is run by Oak and Lead Outpost is run by Bill. Apparently Bill thinks highly of himself as he's made artificial Pokemon and it caused a situation where the Pokedex needed to be updated for the first time ever. There are a lot of people against the creation of this Pokemon, not only because it has an effect on Bill's ego, but also because it's unnatural. I also learn he's somewhere nearby, so I go look for him and get surprised by a sudden battle when I accidentally walk into him. His battle sprite looks quite sinister. This is also the first double battle in the game. I hope to see more of these since I noticed that a lot of Pokemon get moves that are great for double battles. After defeating him, we learn a bit about a new location, Tartarus Station. He explains that it's an abandoned area with supreme technology and he's gonna go over there. There is a small cave with an NPC in it north of town. I explore a bit and catch a Calamita and Quirry. Quirry gets added to the team because I just really like the design. There's nothing else I can do here, so I continue on. Lead Tickets is the next location, an actual forest. A new area means new Pokemon. I catch a Mandroach, Secola, Droplet, Hoohoo and... I noticed that Droplet has Drizzle as an ability, so I add it to my team in place of Manduag. After clearing this area, my beacon evolves into Aegon and Vino into Marshwine. This forest exits into Asheron Clearing and Asheron Vestige. What the hell are these location names? I have no idea how to pronounce these words. Okay, three new Pokemon are encounterable here. Bellshoot, Ceylon and Smoglu. This area has a lot of abandoned buildings where Pokemon live. While clearing the outside area, Droplet evolves into Niagrain. There are two buildings that lead to the Cold Storage, where you can catch some Ice-type Pokemon. There is nothing special in particular here, I just find a key that can be used to evolve a Pokemon. North of Etcheron Vestige, there's a lab called Legaton Lab. I defeat every trainer here and catch some steel type Pokemon, including this Dronma that I add to the team in place of Aegon. At the end of this dungeon, Anki evolves into Flame Ape and Whitening into Pelistorm. I also want to mention that Niagrain is really good at this point in the game. It's just one-shotting everything with Hydro Pump, which has 90 base power and 100 accuracy in this game. The lab leads to another dungeon-like area, the Waterworks. This also leads into a deeper area called the Static Room, where you can find the three starters of this game. There are a bunch of trainers to fight in the previous three areas and they are starting to get fully evolved Pokemon and my team is starting to fall behind because I found the substitute farming to be too good. I do try to get through the story with my current Pokemon and nearly get defeated in a forced battle by a Registatic. I managed to catch it with Niagrain as my final Pokemon left. The Registatic encounter is part of a small story about a guard looking for a co-worker that's stuck in a room resembling Surge's gym from the Kanto games. 
If you free the co-worker, you will get attacked by that Radri static. Throughout every cutscene, dialogue plays from the original Pokemon Fire Red game, where the biker gang is harassing people on island 2 and 3. I don't know if this is intentionally left in the game, but it was very confusing at first. I return to the Norris Pokemon Center and start grinding on substitutes. By grinding, I notice that you'll have final evolutions by the time you reach level 28 or slightly higher. After grinding everyone to level 30, this is my team now. Drown Mega with Volt Absorb to defend my Pokemon who are weak to electric, ground and poison. Memo Swamp with Sap Sipper to wall grass types. Niagrain with Drizzle to set up rain and support Pelostorm and Mamo Swamp. Pelostorm, my starter, with Swift Swim and the best abuser of rain. Flame Ape, who's a decent setup sweeper, but I don't know if I'll keep it on my rain team. And over Qualm, a special oriented bulky psychic cosmic type. I didn't really know who else to add at this point, but this thing seemed quite solid. It does have barely any defense though. Finally, after all the battling and grinding, I can carry on. The next area after the waterworks is called Kokitas River. I encounter Professor Oak here and he says they are getting ready to head for Tartarus Station. Apparently they are testing out an Amalga form, so I bet we are fighting that thing again soon. Kokitas River also serves as a route, so there are wild Pokemon and trainers here. I don't encounter any new evolution lines and the trainers get one shot most of the time because I have moves that are 90 to 120 base power at level 30, which is kinda overkill. At the end I reach Indigo Plateau, I mean Tartarus Station. This location is what the game has been building up to. The first floor is just a giant spin tile puzzle like the one you see in Kanto's Rocket Hideout. I came across an NPC that explains what has happened before I arrived. The Amalga forms have spiraled out of control and they are taking control of their trainers. Professor Oak seems to be in danger so I head into the next room and there's a possessed oak. That challenges me to a battle with several Amalga forms. They are pretty bulky, maybe that's why I get all these strong ass moves. The next first two Amalga forms only use metronome, but they don't get any crazy moves, luckily. Now for the first time we see new forms. The Amalga form Alpha, which seems to have attributes from Apom, Hitmontop and Laudrit. After defeating the Amalga forms, Oak snaps out of their control and explains that Bill has continued deeper into the facility. Going in deeper, I get into an area that resembles Cinnabar Mansion. I can encounter a Xerkomir here, which looks like a uh, meaty Xerky tree. I'm not sure what I'm looking at. Other encounterable Pokemon are the final evolutions of Pokemon I already encountered throughout the game. I battle some people that are taken over by Amalga forms. They are called Tortured Souls. In this one I encounter a new form, Amalga form Lambda. Its body comes from Electros, the part on its head is Marip's tail and according to the docs there is something from Serena in here too but I don't see what it is. I'd say there is also more elements from different Pokemon but it's not mentioned anywhere. Going underground, I start encountering many more tortured souls and amalgaforms. A new one here called Amalgaform Phi. So Phi here has the right hand of a Kabutops, the left hand of a Kingler, the belly of a Charizard, the left leg of a Magmortar, and the right leg is Milotic tail. Apparently it also has a part of Vulpix, but I don't immediately see where it's supposed to be. This form has powerful special attacks with 120 base power and can can be checked by Overcrawl. Further on I encounter a trainer with Amalgaform Epsilon. I see parts from Claydol's head, Dusknoir's arm, Rhyferior's tail and Malamar's tentacles. The docs say there is also something from Spiritomb in the design, I guess it's the smile above Claydol's part, I'm not sure. The next form I encounter is Amalgaform Delta. It resembles a spider-like figure with Metagross's head as a body. It has an eye or wing from Masquerade and then its legs are parts from other Pokemon including Beedrill's arm, Scizor's arm, Beautyfly's nose, Ariados's leg, Lydian's arm and Pinsir's horn. It is incredibly bulky, but it only knows Rock Slide and a few physical bug-typed attacks. 
Amalgaform Zeta has parts from High Dragon's head, Mega Altaria's head, and Hatterene's head. The body itself doesn't seem to resemble anything in particular. When you exit Tartarus Station, you can go to the left to enter a different part of the facility where you can encounter Amalga forms. The first one I encountered was a shiny one. It is pink instead of grey, or rather magenta colored. If you continue with the normal path, you can encounter the other Amalga forms like Delta, Phi and Lambda. When I entered the final building by accident, I was shocked that the final battle was already here, and that it happened so sudden. A warning would've been cool, but oh well. The final boss is Bill, surprise surprise. He's the guy who set up this outbreak. He explains his reasoning, it basically comes down to him being bored of his day-to-day -day life, and he wants to change shit. In his own words, something terrible had to happen, so he can play the hero. Oh wait, I, I read that wrong, he wants me to be the hero? And he's saying that the player character is the creation of Bill, and that Bill has created this facility and every Pokemon on this island. Okay, that's not the silly twist that I expected. Bill challenges me to a final battle with his Amalga forms. Now that I know their weaknesses, stats and moves, they are pretty easy to predict and take out. Bill does have a final Amalga form that hasn't been shown yet, Amalga form Omega. This form is also present in the sister game Pokemon Altered, where it's a strong single stage Pokemon. The Omega form is typeless, with Protean as an ability which can actually backfire if it changes into a disadvantageous type. This thing has a BST of 7 the highest in the game, but most of it goes into its ball, so it doesn't deal crazy damage luckily. Its parts come from a lot of Pokemon, namely Dodio, Blastoise, Yanma, Tyranitar, Meryl, Mightyena, Kabutops and Exploud. After winning, Bill is pleased that he lost, that his creation brought him some distraction from being bored. Bill still intends to shut down this world he built and will use the information for next time, whatever that means. And that is where Pokemon Amalga Magenta ends. As you can see in the Hall of Fame, this is my final team, here is what I thought of them. Bellastorm, my beloved ghost electric starter. This Pokemon was great during the whole game, though I thought I would make more use of Swift Swim and Lightning during my playthrough with Niagrain along its sides. I don't really have anything bad to say about this guy, its move pool is filled with lots of types including the electric type move, lightning and ice type move, snow squall to form a bolt beam combo. On top of that it also learns ghastly haze and hurricane, ghost and flying type moves respectively. Its stats are sort of balanced out with an emphasis on HP and special attack. My Pelestorm had Shed Bell as an item and Swift Swim as an ability. Its moves were Lightning, Snow Squall, Ghastly Haze and Hurricane. Memo Swamp is very good in the early game, as it's nearly indestructible with the buffed Absorb, though I feel like it falls off in power in late game. It's a Water Grass type with Sap Super as an ability, but the late game has basically no grass moves on opponents, so it can't make any use of it. At least throughout the early to mid game, it was able to keep grass types away from my team. Mammal Swamp is a physical attacker that doesn't get access to a physical draining move like Horn Leech. It's stuck with Absorb, which gets weak over the course of the game, of course. Like I mentioned before, it starts to lack in power in the later fights of the game, so I changed its moveset to make use of Storm Surge's passive damage and recover to stall. Memoswamp then kinda changed from a self-sufficient tank to a stalling machine. It was probably better to keep it as a Marshwine, the pre-evolution and give that an Eviolite if I were to use passive damage from Ensnare or Storm Surge as a main source of dealing damage. My Memo Swamp came equipped with Shed Bell and Sap Super. It moves were Storm Surge, Seed Bomb, Rock Slide and Recover. Nyagrain was a Pokemon that I purely caught for the Drizzle ability, but ended up being a very powerful party member on its own. It complemented Pelistorm and Mamoswamp with the Rainy Weather and my slower party members with Sticky Web.
In the late game it was able to learn Quiver Dance, which led to many, many trainers being swept. Fun fact, Niagrain and its pre-evolution droplet are the oldest non-tweaked designs that make an appearance in Amalgam Magenta. Both of them were designed in October 2017, which is 5 years ago at this point, and haven't been touched since then. I gave my Niagrain Mystic Water and its moves were Foam Geyser, Air Slash, Quiver Dance and Sticky Web. Drawn Mega, the protector of my Niagrain and Memo Swamp. Drawn Mega is a steel flying type with the Volt Absorb ability. This only leaves it with a fire weakness and immunity to ground, poison and electric. It's a good all-around Pokemon that complements the party really well. It has high stats, only its speed being on the low end. So on top of its immunities and resistances, it has the defensive capabilities to be a great tank. It even walled one of the Amalga forms at the end of the game. My Drawn Mega had Volt Switch, Mirror Ray, Signal Beam and Tornado as its moves and held an Assault Fest for even more bulk. Flame Ape and the Pre-Evolution Anki are one of my favorite designs in the game. He was very good at the beginning of the game. He one-shot most early game trainers with his multi-hit moves. His Defiant ability also came in handy because a lot of the early game Pokemon randomly throw stat lowering moves at you, which raised Flame Ape's attack by two stages and it could use Flame Charge in combination to immediately start sweeping. He started lacking in power in the final stages of the game. It always missed one shots and got KO'd in return. This might be because I chose to keep Hell Haymaker over Flare Blitz, which is 35 BP stronger. Even with the Choice Band equipped, it wasn't getting KO's that often. Still, I think with a moveset consisting of Flare Blitz, High Jump Kick, Sucker Punch, and Rising Fury, this Pokemon is worth a spot on your team. Overquelm is one of the few Pokemon that sports the new cosmic type and its design definitely resembles that. I built mine as a Calmite sweeper. But near the end I started to feel like it was better suited as a tanky support Pokemon to support the Pokemon that have actual power behind them. It has very high HP and special defense, decent speed and special attack, but abysmal attack and defense. It learns good attacking moves, but its support moves can't be ignored. It's one of the few Pokemon that can learn both screen moves. If it needs to deal big damage quickly, it can use Meteor Shower, a Draco Meteor clone for the Cosmic type. Gamma Ray, a Cosmic type attack with 80 BP that can raise all stats, is also in its arsenal. Recover can be used while supporting or while setting up. It lacks in power in the early to mid game because it takes a while to get extra sensory. Before that you have to do with a weaker version of confusion. I ended up using Overquelm with Aftermath as its ability and extra sensory, Gamma Ray, Recover and Calm Mind as its moves. Near the end game it was equipped with Leftovers. As I said at the start of the video, I wanted to complete the Pokedex, which was pretty easy to do, thanks to the substitutes and reusable Pokeballs. Remember that I told you about their incredibly low catch rate? After attempting to catch them over 100 times with an Ultra Ball, yes, the catch rate is that low. I decided to use my Master Ball on one. These things can evolve with an item that's obtained very easily. The evolution is so cool and cute at the same time. The most time consuming Pokemon to get was the Amalgaform Omega. I had to train the shiny Amalgaform that I got to level 63, because it can only evolve through high friendship. I don't want to know how many substitutes I defeated for it, but after one more level I got the Omega form to complete my final slot in the Pokedex. Also fun fact, during my playthrough I completely missed a whole optional town area called Port Chiron. It has an altar form of Ducklet and Swana that I might have used instead of Flame Ape, so it's a bummer that I didn't pass by this place. I was happy to see that a ROM hack as small as this has room for optional areas and fights. As for my final thoughts about Pokemon Amalgam Magenta, no doubt the biggest attraction are the Fakemon and their amazing designs. 
I don't like all of them, but I can't deny that these sprites are extremely well made. I am really looking forward to playing Alterat Rekindled and Varia Blue when they release, as I will get to see many more Fakemon sprited by the same team. Then for the game itself, I found the story to be a bit dry, though I give the game a pass on that aspect, as this is just a preview of what's in store for us in the future. The story was most likely not the most important part for the dev team. It's also a shorter Pokemon game than normal, which was a fun change for once. The region was fine, it gave the player a lot of variety in locations, but I gotta say it did feel like they were just disjointed at times. A lot of locations are linked together through tunnels or caves, so I gotta applaud the devs for designing the region this way. This is a decent solution to the lack of fast travel. If this game ever gets an update, I would like to see the following things. Please add a move reminder in the final Pokemon Center. At that point in the game, players are finalizing their movesets. And sure, I can backtrack to a different Pokemon Center, but it's just a time waster. Speaking of backtracking, I mentioned this before, but fast travel would be pretty cool. The shortcuts between locations are great though. One last thing I would like to see is a level cap or level scaling mechanic that is only used for the final boss. Also a warning before you enter the final room would be appreciated. I was slightly unprepared when I accidentally entered the final building. Well, that was my experience with Pokemon Amalga Magenta. I hope you enjoyed my take on something akin to a review of a Pokemon ROM hack. It was a lot of fun to do something different for once, so I will be experimenting more with other content in the future. If you got this far into the video, please leave a like and let me know what you think of this ROM hack. If you want to know more about the Fakemon in this hack and Amalga Magenta, then definitely check out the sources in the description. Until next time, and have yourself a good one.